Hallelujah. 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 So much for that. Glory. Glory. Y'all doing good today? Yes. Everybody have the victory? On top. Hallelujah. We've been teaching this series. This is part three of the series on God's holy remnant. And the more I look into this, the more I understand why the understanding this kind of a message is important. Because you may not realize this, God has had you on a journey, a spiritual journey. And this journey has brought you to a place where you have a deeper hunger for present day truth, a deeper desire to understand the things of God in a fresh new way, a deeper desire to experience the goodness and the greatness of God where you want to hear what he's saying cutting edge. Yes. What Peter calls being established in this present truth. Meaning, if something isn't truth, you discern it right away. Mm -hmm. If you're in any kind of setting and some, something is said that's unscriptural, whether it's in a church setting or if you're watching a Christian television program or listening to something on the radio or just around people that are just talking about the things of God and they say things that are not biblical, you know it right away. Why, is it, why do you know it right away and others don't? While they're saying, amen, that's right, you're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not quite right with that. <laughs> and sometimes someone can say <laughs> the right thing, but not in the spirit of truth. Yeah. Yes. Did you get hold of that? Yeah. There are people proclaiming messages, but it's not in the vein of the spirit of truth. And it's like they're saying the wrong thing because they're saying the right thing with the wrong spirit, and it's designed to deceive. That's why many false doctrines got a stronghold in the church because people started off saying the right thing and then people are saying, amen, that's right, that's right, that's right. And they weren't discerning and then as they went along, they started saying the wrong thing but God's people are already in that amen mode and their ears were not trained to hear and decipher what is of God and what's not of God. That's why Jesus said, be careful how you hear. Yeah. And we can be hearing things that's not what the Holy Spirit is saying and going along with it agreeing with it and thinking that's God when really is, it isn't. So we've got to make sure that we understand and can properly relate to the journey. When I was a young youngster coming up in the Church of God in Christ, I used to hear an older saint say, I wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. And I think there's something to that. Okay, I'm not putting that down. I think there's something to that. Because you begin to appreciate where God's brought you from yeah. as you progress in God, yes. as you grow in the things of God, as you get sharper in the things of the Spirit, that you get a deeper appreciation for what God is saying and doing in your life right now. And even though some things may have happened in your life uh, that weren't necessarily what God had planned, what God wanted, wasn't God's best, uh, but you got victory over it. And I'm going to address that in a little while here, where we can begin to understand even when things have gone wrong in our lives, uh, when you come out of cleansing, forgiveness, mercy, you're a different person. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I'm going to address that later on. Whoop. Now, looking at this holy remnant, we looked at, we start this series off looking in Isaiah chapter 1, uh, verses 4 through 9, that ends with, unless the Lord had left us a very small remnant, which meant that which remains, uh, we don't know what we would have done. We also looked in Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 8, where God talks about the remnant again, which means a residue or residual of, uh, or surviving portion. We also saw in Revelation chapter 3, I'm going to turn over there, the church at Sardis depicts the remnant of God for the church age. What does that mean? Well, Revelation chapters 2, really 1, 2, and 3 are relevant to the church age. Starting in chapter 4, the church age is over. The rapture has taken place, and for the next seven years, the church is actually in heaven and going through the process of several things. Uh, one of them is called uh, the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat of Christ. It ends with the, the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19. And then the, the marriage supper of the Lamb actually ends up, starts in heaven. I want to teach you this sometimes. It's, it's crazy what happens. The marriage supper of the Lamb starts in heaven. And then he says, blessed are those who have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who would those be? Those were the saints that survived the tribulation period, but they're not in heaven. They're still on earth. So Enoch said he saw the Lord come back with ten thousands of his saints. So the marriage supper that started in heaven is going to end in the holy city, Jerusalem. 
And it's a phenomenal picture that God gives concerning his grace and his mercy, but also his never-ending covenant with Israel. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, and we shared this last week, that Sardis was the dying church. The word Sardis has several meanings. Number one, it means a remnant. Number two, it means that which remains. Number three, it means a precious stone. Actually, the Sardius is a, actually a beautiful diamond that comes from the same Greek word as Sardis. The Hebrew word means that which has escaped or is escaping. So the remnant escapes the negative implications in the culture. Because what has happened in our culture that has become very Babylonian in nature has infiltrated the church. So there are a lot of people who are quote-unquote saved, but they don't understand their, their salvation, and they have begun to take on characteristics of the world, think like the world. We've got to be careful to use certain kind of terminologies. What I mean by that, there's a popular term that's used both in secular circles and, and the church called transformation. And I believe in transformation. But what do we mean when we say that, though? If we think that Babylon's going to be transformed, forget about it. The Bible never teaches the transformation of Babylon. So how do we impact Babylon? And we have to understand, our nation, our culture, our society at large has become Babylonian in nature. Okay? Godless, hedonistic anti-Christ, resistant of what God says, what God says, uh, adapting to secularism, humanism, and postmodernism. That's Babylonianism. So what we have is a Babylonian culture that God wants to raise up his people to invade that culture. In the meantime, seemingly, his people are becoming more like the culture. So the ones we're called to save, we're adapting their ideologies, their practices, their mindsets, their worldview. And we're in danger now because what is happening, generationally we're losing some things here. And what I've strived to do as a parent is impart the values that I have that are biblically based into my children and to my grandchildren. I sit down and we talk with them and break bread with them and fellowship with them, laugh with them, act silly with them, but also share with them, here's how we see the world as saints of the Most High God. Here's how we conduct ourselves. Here's our perspective. Now, we know certain things in the world, and we don't love the world. We love the people in the world. The Bible tells us to love not the world. So we don't love that Babylonian culture. We have to raise up a standard for them, not be condescending to them, not act like we're better than them, but have a mindset that God has brought us out of the darkness to bring us into his light. Now we have a mandate to go after those who are still in the darkness. And we don't go there flashing a big old flashlight in their face to come out this mess you in, okay? We, we go there by loving kindness. Yeah. He never changed his ways of doing that. What does that mean? The Bible says in Jeremiah 3, by loving kindness have I drawn thee. So there's a constant drawing of that loving kindness from people that are stuck there. And we all have friends, relatives, acquaintances that we know that are stuck there. And God gives us wisdom how to bring them out. He who wins souls is what? Wise. So he grants wisdom. We just can't go in there with our Bible beating them over the head telling you're going to go straight to hell. If you don't get right, I'm going to fly and you're going to fry. We can't go that way with them. That is not going to work. Okay? We have to know how to reach people to impact them. And God gives wisdom in doing that in the different genres you operate and function in. So when you understand that, he has to raise up that remnant, like even though the church is dying in many respects, what I mean by that, I don't mean the church is dead, what I do mean is the things that were fervent in us in days gone by, like prayer, fasting, holiness, seeking God, crying out, you don't even hear those kinds of terms in the modern day church. The modern day seeker friendly church doesn't even think like that. Repentance is not a part of their dialogue between them and God. They're, they, they, I've been in their prayer meetings. They pray real surfacey prayers. They don't go in, as it were, okay? They pray very surfacey prayers. And it's like, Lord, Lord, just be with us today. Lord, help us. And Lord, just, we just love you, Lord. And there's a modern-day thinking in Christianity 
that doesn't fit in with what the Bible talks about, what David talks about, okay? I will seek the Lord. My soul cries out for thee in a dry and a thirsty land. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul. They don't think like that. That's not where their hearts are. So there has to be a remnant that will raise up the standard for them. That makes sense, everybody? Yes. Go back to this passage. He says here, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God, and those are listed in Isaiah chapter 11, the seven spirits of the, of the Holy Spirit, and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Now, what does that really, really mean? What is it really saying in the Greek? Yes, you are really alive unto me, but there are certain principles that I want to see manifested in you. They are dying. They are drying up. That's what he's saying to them. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. This word here, watchful, is the Greek word gregarios. It means uh, to keep awake, to be alert, to be vigilant. We get our name Gregory from that word, actually. Mm. So the church at Sardis uh, was heavily influenced by the negative spiritual state of the surrounding culture. And it was causing death to manifest in them, though they were yet alive. So he tells them what to do, to be watchful. In other words, um, you've got to be sensitive and discerning as to what you allow yourself to even think on, meditate on, or even look at. Okay? Be alert. And strengthen the things which remain. There's some things that remain that must be strengthened concerning your value system, concerning how you think, concerning good sound doctrine. So he said, make sure you strengthen that, that are ready, and those are the, there are those who are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. That word there, perfect, means uh, to operate at a level of maturity. So there are people operating, functioning at a level of immaturity. And you have to ask yourself, where are you in that whole scope? Mature or immature? Where is your growth process at? And people think they grow just because they know more Bible and to quote more scripture. And that is not the basis for growth. The basis for growth is your deep level of hunger. You grow based upon how hungry you are. Are you hungry for the word of God? Are you hungry for the presence of God? As the deer pants for the water, are you panting for the presence of our God? That denotes your growth. So remember, he says in verse 3, therefore, how you have received and heard, uh, hold fast and do what? Repent. So he's telling them, here is the key. Make sure you're not allowing things in your life that's not like God to remain and to stay and not undealt with. We can't go on with bitterness and unforgiveness and hearts that are hurt and never try to get healed. Now, all of us in this room, at one time or another, if you're in this world, something or someone or some situation is going to hurt you. That's, you know, welcome to life. So you can't get stuck there and think, well, that's just... With my lot in life, and there are people who've been stuck. They never got out of that state of being hurt, wounded, damaged. When you don't deal with it, it turns into bitterness. You know how many people that are bitter walking around? I mean, I don't mean people in the world. I mean Christians. Because of what was done to them in their family, in their church, on their job, in their relationships. And bitterness turns into a root, according to Hebrews chapter 12. And then that root springs up and it says it defiles me. You know, other people around that person would begin to get defiled because of it. They have a foul mood. They're indifferent. They're obstinate. They're hard to get along with them. And they want to share their story with everybody. And, they'll, and if you ever listen to before too long in the conversation, uh, they'll start sharing with you the things they are bitter about. And uh, before you know it, it begins to defile you you'll start taking on their uh, offense because of what they told you about people that you know what they did to them. Yikes! And as a result, when you hang up that phone and get, up that, get away from that conversation, you feel full of crap. You feel weighted. You feel like you're on a downward spot because of what you listen to. Well, you got to make sure that you stay clean, pure from all of that kind of foolishness. So he's making it real clear here the importance of repentant, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, uh-oh, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. This is not talking about the rapture. This is talking about the judgment beginning at the house of God. 
and he brings judgment seasonally to the house of God. And those that respond properly will move into the remnant level. Meaning, uh, not yet, doesn't mean others aren't saved. Not everybody's going to go where you go. Don't get mad at them. Don't get disgruntled towards them. Don't allow yourself to like, what's your problem? Can't you see what's, what God is doing? Everybody's not going to see it. Can't see it. Amen. Every, they're not. For whatever reason, get over that part, okay? Just rejoice at what God is showing you. And don't get a superior, sedity, better than their mindset. But know that God's doing something fresh and new in you. Because he always has to have a remnant when he brings on something fresh and new. It never starts with a large group of people. It never starts with a big mega ministry. It always will start with a remnant. And when that remnant begins to fulfill that, then it impacts the larger sphere of the body. When that remnant begins to walk in the present day truth and release that glory, release that anointing, release that power, oh, it will impact the masses, but it's got to start somewhere. That makes sense to everybody? Yes. He says in verse 4, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. There you have the remnant. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Walk with me denotes fellowship. Victory only comes through knowledge of the word of God. So that walk with him denotes intimate fellowship. And as we fellowship with him and walk in this, this white raiment, which denotes uh, purity and a cleansing and a purge of everything that's not like God, uh, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Well, that means it's possible for a name to be blotted out of the book of life. Listen to everybody? Yes. Because that, that goes against the once saved, always saved doctrine. Yeah. The very fact that he said this means it's a possibility for the name to be blotted out. Okay? But I will confess his name before my father and before, notice, his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And let's get a little deeper today on this whole ideology of the remnant. Turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 11. I want to start at verse 11. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, when the remnant is mentioned, it's referring to the tribe of Judah first and then to the other tribes of Israel. And here in chapter 11, this, and you have to understand how the scripture is laid out because sometimes we can take scriptures and dispensationalize them. What that means is that there are different dispensations, and so that only applies to this dispensation and not to this, this dispensation. Well, that's true. You can take the bulk of the Old Testament and say it doesn't apply to us because it's dispensational. We have to understand there are certain things in the Old Testament that really contain the revelation for the New Testament. So the church has been grafted in. So now we have not just the same covenant, but a better covenant established upon better promises. Now, they did not have certain truths that we have in the old covenant. So we find out what the truths that they have, and then we bring them through the cross. What does that mean? Well, because of the cross, the things they had to work for, by grace through the cross, uh, we don't have to work for they had to go and have burnt offerings. Uh, they had to go and present themselves. Uh, and then in, in the case of the priest, only the priest could represent the people before God uh, and present burnt offerings for the, all the sins of the people. Now we've all been made to be kings and priests under our God. Why? Because we have a better covenant. Makes sense, everybody? Yeah. So we just can't discard certain things in the Old Testament that only applies to them and not to us. We have to know what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. So as we go through this passage, I'm going to break some things down to make it more relevant to what, the, what he's saying to the church today through this passage. So here in Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 11, it shall come to pass, he says here, on that day. Now what does that mean? Come to pass, or should I say, in that day. In that day is referring to the last days, eschatologically meaning, meaning is the last days of the church age going into the tribulation and then the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. 
that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. The second time denotes the second coming, which is at the end of the tribulation period. Okay? Let's keep on reading here. To recover the remnant of his people. Now, what does that mean? The remnant of his people has to do with the people who are living in the time of, when it says, at that time, it shall come to pass. So, what we're looking at now is the last day's church that's leading into what we know to be the tribulation period. So, when the Lord Jesus comes back, Jewish time will start again. What does that mean? When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghosts, at that moment, Jewish time in God's dealing with them, the children of Israel came to a screeching halt. That's why Daniel said in Daniel chapter 9, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So at that moment, Jewish time came to a screeching halt in the sense that how God was dealing with the children of Israel came to an end. Then God pulls out another stopwatch called the church age. Has roughly 2,000 ticks on it. We're in the latter stages of that right now. So he's dealing with the church, his elect. The church is the key for impacting Israel. That's why we're to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's why we're to always have a heart for Israel. That's what Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 is talking about. And the remnant is mentioned even there in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. So when you understand that conceptually, the church age is key to everything right now. Let me say, what do you mean by that? Until the church is really the church, and right now we're not, okay, what the Bible describes us to be, Jesus can't even come back. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Until we move into the restoration of all things described in Acts chapter 3, verses 19, 20, and 21, says heaven is holding Jesus back until there is a restoration of all things. So Jesus can't come back until what the church is originally designed to be. When he comes back, he's not coming back from this weak, emaciated, carnal, dried up, dying church. When he comes back, it'll be for a victorious, glorious church. So there is work to be done. So I say unpack your bags. Those who are waiting for the rapture to come any day, unpack those bags. We've got some work to do. What God, what I believe God's about to do is a quick work. I don't believe it's going to take, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I believe in the next few years we're going to see the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we have ever seen. That's why God's doing the things in you right now and getting you ready for it. And you got to understand what that means. It not, doesn't mean that you're just going to have wonderful times in God. It means the anointing, the mandate, the calling, and the giftings of God deposited in you are about to exponentially be used in ways like you've never imagined before. That's what that means. That means he's been preparing you for a long time for the season he's moving you into. And it's not just for older saints. It's not just for middle-aged saints. Even sons and daughters. Expect your little children to prophesy yeah. at the dinner table. Yeah. Expect signs and wonders and miracles. When they go to school, they'll come and say, guess what? I prayed for one of my students. I laid hands on it because they were coughing. And all of a sudden, they got healed. Expect that, that your sons and daughters will prophesy. Ooh. We're about to see something exponentially like we have never seen before. You have to know your God in all of his glory, power, and awesomeness ain't going to let us go out on a bunch of weasels and punks. Right. Right. We're going to go out as a glorious, victorious church. Yes. Yes. This ain't going to be some little church that's all, come yes. quick, Lord Jesus, things are so bad down here, we're all going to die. If you don't come, stop it. Right. Amen. He's about to do something through you that he's doing in you right now. That's going to radically change everything around you. Yes. Where that power, that anointing, that glory is oozing out of you everywhere you go. And when you take that kind of glory, it changes the atmosphere. When you carry that kind of anointing, it will molecularly change everything around you by the power of God. you got to understand what's in you. Do you realize what's in you? Begin to see yourself in the same stature that God sees you. Amen. Never look at your life based upon your past. Amen. You'll never go anywhere in God. That's right. Never look at, look at your life based upon uh, the bad things that you've got to overcome. Uh, God does not look at you based upon any of that stuff. God looks at you positionally. Please get hold of this. 
Positionally, positional truth will always eclipse temporal truth. Temporal truth, though it's truth, it will change. Positional truth does not change. For instance, your Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6, you've been made to sit in the heavenly places where? In Christ. That's positional truth. Whenever you see in your Bible, in Christ, in him, by Christ, by him, through Christ, through him, it's always referencing positionally how God sees you. So no matter what goes on in your life, it doesn't change how God sees you. So he has predestined you and given you a holy calling where? In Christ. That doesn't change because things mess up along the way. That doesn't change because you do something out of God's will or let sin come into your life. He always has a way of escape. And the remnant church will always understand the way of escape. So no matter what you're going through, don't get stuck there. No matter what you're experiencing, that is not your destiny. Don't be like people that come to a certain place and they feel like, well, this is it for me. It's kind of like if you want to make a trip to Chicago and you're going out I-94, right around, I think right at the telegraph, there's a sign that says Chicago 262 miles. Yes. How would I look like a complete idiot if I did this? Seeing that sign, pulling off the road to the side of the road, jumping out of my car, running to that sign says, Chicago, I found you, baby. I found you. That's stupid. That's the sign that says you're on the right road. There are things that God will put as a signpost to let you know you're on the right road. Don't get stuck there. Don't be camp out there. Don't think you made it because you're there. Understand you're going somewhere else. There is something called a destiny. When I talk to young people, sometimes I'm asked, I'm talking to a young group tonight, as a matter of fact. It's a bunch of uh, Caucasians. Uh, from all over the country that felt like God told them to move to Detroit. So they live in the hood like Dexter and Jerry Road area is where they live. They live on Claremont and Woodward area. I mean, and they bought homes. So they're professionals. They're, they work for major corporations that so they feel like God's called them to Detroit. So tonight, they asked me to come and speak to them on what, what they should be doing. And what's the history of our city? What is God saying? I'm, I'm like, you have all night because I've got a lot to say to them. But I believe God's raising up people like that. In, the, in these last days. So you got to understand on your journey, there's something specific he's bringing you into. It's incumbent upon you as the remnant to know what that is. Yes. That's just not going to come because you love Jesus. Knowing that's not going to because you come to church on Sunday. There's a place you have to go call there. Yes. And you won't know it till you get there. Yes. You'll know. Okay, this one's supposed to be. This one. Not, not a building or a church, an uh, intimate place with him mm -hmm. where you're hearing him clearly. You're grasping things at a deeper level. You're relating at a higher level. You have a deep sense of knowing. Certain things you hold, you think, you feel, but a certain place when you get there, this is what you know. When you know that you know mm -hmm. that you know, ain't open for a discussion. You ain't trying to get no counseling on it. You're not trying to get anybody's input or anybody's opinion. This you know. There's certain things you did. You know your name. You don't go and ask him, you know what, I think my name is, um, <laughs> what do you think about that? That's ridiculous. You know your, you don't get any counseling on your name. You don't have to go and get anybody's opinion about it. Is this really my name? You know it. Well, there's a place called there when you know that you know I'm on point with God. Yes. Here is what I'm supposed to be doing. Here is my assignment. So when I go and talk to young people, oftentimes, I tell them, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not die unless you can answer these five questions. And I tell them what those five questions are. Number one, who am I? Number two, why am I here? Number three, where am I going? Number four, what must I do? Number five, how will I do it? Each one of those questions has a caveat attached to it. For instance, who am I? That's their identity or their image. Why am I here? That's their purpose. Where am I going? That's their destiny. What must I do? That's their calling. How will I do it? Those are the giftings God's given them to carry out whatever it is they must do. So everybody has that. That's not unique to any certain group. Everybody has that. It's in their DNA. So it's up to them to make their calling and their election sure. That onus is upon you. 
And that comes out of your relationship with God. No matter where you are in your stature and growth level in the things of the Spirit, as you pursue that, those five questions you'll be able to answer when you, as you get to the place called there. When you know that you know that you know. Why? There'll be circumstances to tell you you don't know. Your circumstances in life will say just the opposite, will mock you, will t tell you your life ain't going nowhere. If it was, you'd be doing this. If it was, it, it looked like this. So you got to know that you know that you know. Like what I'm doing right now, I know that for this season, here's what God has me doing. So I'm being tested because I'm about to go and enlarge and talk to the masses. Pretty soon, enjoy this small, intimate setting for now. It won't always be like this. So I'm kind of enjoying it in, in a sense, but in a sense, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for the next level. And God is giving insight, clarity on how that's going to look. How, and it's going to be a different dynamic of church that I've ever seen before. So he's getting us ready for that. He's wiring us for that. And he's letting me try out messages that I haven't preached before like this on you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much obliged. <laughs> But you have to understand, when you know that you know that you know, your circumstance cannot discourage you. What people think and say will not deter you when you know that you know that you know. But you've got to be confident of this very thing. That he who's begun a good work in you will carry it out, perform it until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Now back to this passage here. He goes and mentions groups of people. This is very interesting. That the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant. This word here, recover, is the Greek word quana, spelled Q. I'm sorry, the Hebrew word, forgive me. Hebrew word quana, spelled Q-A-N-A. -A. It means to purchase, to procure, to redeem, to possess, to acquire. Watch this next one. It means to be jealous over. Wow. It means to own. So God, in the last days, is going to raise up this remnant, and he's very jealous over them. He owns them. Now, this means he doesn't own others, too, but there's a, di a dimension of belonging to and covering because he has something particular in mind. What does that mean? Keep on reading. We'll see what that means. To recover the remnant of his people who are left. From where? From Assyria and Egypt, from Pathos and Cush. These are black people. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Cush actually means Ethiopian or the, the, the dark skinned one. From Elam and Shinar, from Hannah, from Hamath, rather, and the islands of the sea. So this is talking about large segments of people of color that he's going to impact in the last days. What will he do? And he will set up a banner or a standard. That's the remnant. They have to have a standard. So the banner denotes a standard being lifted up. A banner for the nations. And will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah. Judah means what? Praise. So he's never going to forget the voice of praise. Mm. And there's a direct correlation between Judah and, I'm sorry, Judah and the remnant or praise and the remnant. Meaning what? The remnant will always be a praising, worshiping remnant. Where is he going to get these people from? He says they're from the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this is going to be a worldwide impact. This isn't just going to happen in Detroit. This is going to have a global impact through the remnant, raising up the standard that's going to impact people of color. Also, the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. So the hostilities and differences between different races and ethnicities and different cultures will be removed. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. 
but they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west, and that denotes a Babylonian system. So we're going to come upon that system and break its power. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. That deals with Islam and even the Far East. It deals with uh, uh, communism and, 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 and Buddha. Watch this. And they shall lay hand on Edom and Moab and the people of Ammon and shall obey them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river and shall strike it in seven streams up and make men cross over dry shot. There will be a highway for who? Ah, the remnant. A highway denotes holiness. Uh, you're not going to be on the low. There's a higher dimension and there are things in your life that are striking at you to bring you down. Identify what those things are. Because you are part of the remnant. And, and you know, because it varies from person to person, what the proclivities you have towards in certain areas of your life. It could be relationally. It could be even mental torment. Do you know how many people suffer? Oh suffer from mental torment? Yes. Suffer from depression? Yes. Discouragement? Mm -hmm. Deep sense of anxiety? Mm -hmm. How many people are struggling to even sleep at night? Mm -hmm. I've been getting calls from people that ask for prayer. Pastors have asked me for prayer. And they sit on the side of their bed at night and they can't go because there's like a claw in their brain, they've said. Mm -hmm. They just feel like they can't get any rest. Understand, that's demonic. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's that right. That is of the wicked one. He gives his beloved sleep. Mm -hmm. yeah. He wants our rest to be sweet. Mm -hmm. So what is going on here? Well, depending on what your calling is, uh, you begin to move in certain realms of darkness, um, you, there's lashing back. Yes. There's attack. And the more you move in your destiny and purpose, the more attacks you will have sometimes. Don't think because you're going through a hard time or being attacked a lot or finances being attacked or marriage being attacked or your health being attacked, you must be out of the will of God. Do not buy that way. Amen. If that were true, the Apostle Paul was never in the will of God. I mean, every time he turned around, there was something crazy coming at him. Finally, he just said, it's just a light affliction. And it's just going to last for a moment. And then he gave some detail of what this light affliction looked like in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. Beaten down, left to die, shipwrecked, no food, no clothes, uh, in the midst of the sea, persecuted all the time, stoned and three times. I mean, he listed all these things uh, in chapter 11. And in chapter 4, he calls all those things a light affliction which is but for a moment then he says it's working for me mm. a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory that means God is after some glory in your life that's not unique to the apostle Paul that applies to all of us so when you begin to move in this realm as the remnant of God don't think it's going to all be hunky dory don't think it's going to be without any challenges in the world, you will have tribulation. There's going to be some trouble. What can he go to say here? And there should be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Syria, as it was for Israel, in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. Egypt means the world. So from the time you left the world system, from the time you left Egypt, your life has been watched by the powers that be. And they're looking to cause destruction, confusion, to get you off destiny and purpose. So God says there's a highway. In other words, there's another dimension you can go to that they can't get to. There's a higher level in prayer, a higher level in worship, a higher level in holiness. actually says in Isaiah 10, and there shall be a highway there, and the highway shall be called the highway of holiness. They can't get to you there. So you got to make sure every time you go through these attacks, go to another dimension yeah. in God. There's a place they can't find you yeah. under the shadow of the Almighty. Yeah. Demons go looking for you. They cannot find you. Where did he go? Where is she at? He was just here. They're gone. Why? You're under the shadow of the Almighty. That's the place called there. Demons can't come up in there. Devils can't just walk up in there. Familiar spirits have no access there. So you got to go to that high place. I don't know who you are, what you're going through right now. We all go through stuff. Yeah. But I know how to get to the place called there. And I can see the enemy looking at me, looking like he wants to get to me. But ha, you can't touch this. Right. 
He can't get to that place. In that place, that's where the anointing at its highest level, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Now, look in Micah chapter 7. You're there in Isaiah. Micah chapter 7. I want to start reading in verse 18. Who is a God like you? <laughs> Let's just stop right there. <laughs> I don't know about you. I've studied some of the religions of the world. I've studied Buddhism. I've looked at, I've, I've, I've got a copy of the Quran. I've read the part of the Quran. I've even read, you know, False religions and cults are not the same. Do y'all know that? Yes. Okay. A false religion actually recognizes a higher power, uh, recognize, has a god, like Buddhists uh, ha have a Buddha, um, Muslims have Allah, uh, so they are a false religion. Cults can be even more dangerous because cults will recognize the Bible, in many cases, they have their own Bible, like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. Uh, they have their own translation, okay? But And they recognize Jesus. Actually, uh, the Mormons are called the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. So, the, But they preach another gospel. And according to Galatians chapter 1, it is a, a curse to preach another gospel. So, But that can be very dangerous. So I've studied these different religions and different cults. There is no God like our God. Yes. You ever wonder why we have certain experiences that Buddhists never have? Buddhists never have an anointing that makes them fall on their face, a presence that makes them weep. Muslims never have an anointing that has the ability to destroy yokes and lift burdens. Muslims don't have a God that takes them in their arms and holds them, weeps over them. They don't have those kinds of experiences. Why? They don't relate to, as a father child. Mm -hmm. They're a higher power. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the dimension of relationship because they've never been born again. Yes. When a person is conceived to be born, it's because there is a father involved. Well, you have a heavenly father who put a seed by the Holy Spirit in a woman, a virgin called Mary, and because Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary and we've accepted him as Lord, Master, and Savior, our spirit man was born again, and we have a relationship with someone. It's not a God somewhere, but a Father. It's a different dimension altogether. Relationally, functionally, idealistically, it's a different dimension altogether that no other religion has. So once again, going back, who is a God like you? What do you do that makes you so unique? Pardoning iniquity? Passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? What is this talking about? People who are part of the remnant, They've been through some stuff. In some cases, they've been to hell and back. They've been through some hardship. They've been through some personal failure. David could write about this, and other writers refer to us as the uh, sure mercies of David. They know what it means to be forgiven of a bunch of crap in their lives. Anybody been like that? I put both my hands up, okay? And actually, in the book of Luke, chapter 7, verse 47, Jesus speaks about those who've been forgiven much, love, love much. much. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you know what God's brought you out of, mm -hmm. when you know what God's delivered you from, uh -huh. when you know the strongholds of the wicked one, and it's not always sin, it's stuff that could have been destructive to your life, mm -hmm. like habits and ways of thinking, like relationships, like situations that could have been detrimental to your life spiritually, like being a part of something that was ungodly, what, like be, 
battling deep depression, discouragement, spirit of fear. There are all kinds of things people have been delivered from. It only was the power of God that got them out. Not counseling them, not turning over a new leaf, not trying to be a better person, not trying to get their act together, as it were. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in your eyes. That's what I'm talking about. There's no God but our God that can do that. That's the question Micah is bringing up here. Who is like unto God? Pardoning iniquity. Passing over the transgression of the remnant of his people. So people who are part of this remnant have a deep appreciation for God's forgiveness, God's mercy, and God's grace. Watch this. He does not retain his anger forever, but his mercy endures forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because he delights in mercy, and his mercy, once again, endures forever. He will again have compassion on us and will do what? Subdue our iniquities. In other words, uh, he's not going to hold the things in our lives that our self-will got involved. Iniquity means self-will. He's going to give us the, the power to overcome the negative implications of, of self-will. Wow. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. This is what a lot of preachers get to see a forgiveness from, okay? Well, there's no scripture that says see forgiveness, but that, this is where they get that from. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. In other words, God has not changed his mind. What he has sworn to our fathers, starting back to Abraham, he has not changed his mind concerning the covenant. Now, you are the seed of Abraham. So Abraham started off as a remnant. Abraham was a moon worshiper. Yeah. His whole family was a moon were moon worshippers. You could say he was the first moony. <laughs> we go a little longer. Yes. Keep going. He was the first moony. And God called him Abram, Abram, and established a covenant with him. And one of the reasons he said he did, he said, I know Abraham. Mm -hmm. And I know what he's going to do with his children. Yeah. How he's going to raise his children. So now God has a perpetual seed being raised up generationally. So God will set up a covenant with a person or a family like that. Yeah. God has this thing about how you raise your children. Yeah. And he was real clear with Abraham. Here's what I chose. Because I know what he's going to do with them kids. Mm -hmm. I know what he's going to do with them. And it went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and it kept going on generationally all the way down to you and me, spiritually speaking. Why? Because today, according to the scripture, you are Abraham's seed. So he was the first remnant that God dealt with. Well, he had to go through some battles to get to that point. I'm not going to go there now. But in Genesis chapter 14, after his nephew Lot had been captured by the seven kings of Chattelahomer, he he trained 300 plus trained, hand picked disciples, students, trainees, men, soldiers, whatever you want to call them, in his own household mm -hmm. and went after those five kings and slaughtered them all. Took all their stuff, all their gold, all their silver, all their money, and on the way back, yeah, yeah, yeah. he ran to somebody. Yeah, yeah. come on. Who he ran into was off the charts. Yes. Because he ran into a pre-existent manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ. Yes. His name is Melchizedek. He had no mother, had no father, had no beginning, had no what? He was Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ took on many appearances in the Old Testament uh, and took on human form. More than one time. It happened to Joshua. Who do you think it was talking to? Joshua was talking to? It's called the angel of the Lord. When he said, take off your shoes. Mm -hmm. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Moses. We think that was talking to Moses. Said the same thing to Moses. Mm -hmm. Well, Moses it was really crazy because Moses said to him, "Who shall?"